Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Lord Burlington, thank you for that very kind introduction. I think um, you've set me up so well I can now only disappoint you, so I will do my best to, uh, to do so. But I just want to thank all of you for, for being here tonight. Of course, I want to thank Sotheby's. Um, and of course, this is part of a wider program that we're doing at the National Portrait Gallery, as William said, sort of looking at portraiture and working with lots of organizations, large and small, in London, across the UK, and indeed uh, internationally. And I think it's such a treat for all of us to be able to see these extraordinary things from Chatsworth uh, on display for free, which I think is a really wonderful thing to be able to do and to share with different audiences. I just want to say, to sort of follow um, William's pitch, I grew up in Yorkshire. Um, Chatsworth was one of my go-to places to go and see an extraordinary house and architecture and a, an amazing collection of art. Um, and it's really an honor to be able to try and give back a little bit of what that house and that collection has given to me um, as a trustee. So I'm really happy and proud to be here. And of course, I'm also thrilled to be in conversation with Bella, which I think is just such a special, unique position uh, to, to be in. Um, you'll see on the screen behind us, there's a, a sort of rolling PowerPoint of all of the extraordinary Freuds that are at Chatsworth House, because as we'll talk about tonight, you've seen three that are selected, which are extraordinary, and we'll talk more about those, but it's a much wider collection um, and a much longer standing relationship. And actually, last year for Freud's centenary, um, I was very lucky to be able to see a beautiful exhibition that Chatsworth did, looking at their relationship with Freud. But um, without further ado, on the idea of relationship, I mean, I think as William said, what's so interesting about the display downstairs is, of course, it focuses on portraiture, but also, you know, the, the, the collection that a family has both acquired, commissioned. I know that commissioning is a difficult word, and, and we'll talk more about that. And so I really want to focus tonight on family, both in the sense of a family collection and what that means, as opposed to a, a museum collection. But of course, your, your understanding of, of family and of course, Freud's understanding of family as a painter. So um, I wonder if we could begin by just talking a little bit about your experience of that. Can you be a bit more specific? Uh, <laughs> well, I was going to I was going to ask you about your memories of sitting for the portrait uh, age six months. <laughs> perhaps that's a bit. But basically, I, I mean, I suppose it must be a difficult thing for you to talk about because this is something you've you were born into and you've grown up with, and I mean, w were you? And as William said, that you know you've you've sat for your father over many many years and many occasions. I'm sure many sittings, countless hours. Were you aware of becoming a subject for a painting, or was it just spending time with your father? Well, I suppose because I had quite an untraditional family set up and we he didn't have a he had one sort of traditional beginning of a family and then he just stopped that and had lots of love affairs and produced lots of children when you were talking about that at the beginning I was thinking almost like we were in the Reynolds uh, Joshua Reynolds painting downstairs but it couldn't have been more di different but um, and in a way it was lovely because you know I sat when I saw that painting of me as a baby on the sofa and it was exciting to think that I was in a sort of family set up for a very short amount of time yeah. it's quite a, and um, so that when I did start to sit sort of volunteer to sit um, it was it was very much to spend time with him mm. but also to be in his world and to be of service in in some kind of a way and to sort of absorb and and you know people are supposed to be told sort of what to do by their parents. My father wasn't, didn't ever say, nor did my mother actually. Mm. Um, but in a way, it was a sort of training, like, oh, well, you can do this. And then I learned how to work really by watching him work. Mm -hmm. So it's a rather roundabout sort of way in. But uh. And then just thinking about it from the other perspective, you know, obviously as the sitter, but thinking about the artist's perspective, it, I mean, it seems to me, looking from without, that family was clearly of interest to your father, both in terms of the relationship with the Cavendish family, which we'll talk more about tonight, 
but with his own expanded family. And I suppose what I wanted to ask you is, do you think, you know, his relationship with sitters was often very long-standing and very profound. And was that a practical consideration because his process took a great deal of time, so you just had to have someone that would commit and you would be able to spend time with? Or did he need that sense of intimacy and trust to be able to paint someone? Well, I remember him saying, I want someone who has a hole in their life so that they, he could be, you know, they could be available all the time. How did you feel about that? <laughs> well, I didn't count myself as one of those people, but I felt more like he was a magnet in my life and I was very much wanting to be drawn towards him mm. so that I could get some of that power and some of that family connection. Yeah. And he also didn't really, he certainly wasn't one of those people that talked in kind of sentimental way about family and if anything he eschewed it really because he didn't he started off you know married and then didn't really bother so but there was a real sense of like a, a sort of strange tribe like mm. that we were we we were kind of you know like people in the woods and we had some sort of weird connection. <laughs> I mean, it sounds rather abstract, but it was in a way, yeah. because it was about choice. Everything was about choice. And so he, you know, wanting to paint me, me or want, you know, if he asked you to sit for him, wanted to paint you, it was like this kind of exciting, mm. you know, joining a political party or something. I mean, y y your whole allegiance was just, it was like a visceral thing as well. So yeah. it, it was very exciting. And even though it was, you know, took a long time, but those things didn't really seem to matter. I, I was gonna ask you, was it also daunting or annoying to get the request to sit for a portrait and think, well, this is the next few months written <laughs> off now, or were you always happy to? I was always happy, I suppose, because I'd m mostly sit at night. So if I did have a job, um, then I could do both but I sp when I started sitting I was in my late teens mm -hmm. and I didn't really have much of a job so it was a it was a that was my job and even if I was being hopeless in other areas of my life I was pretty much showing up on time mm -hmm. and that was very important to your father. Yeah. yeah, and I was terribly late, so <laughs> <laughs> um, it was always slightly nerve-wracking to see if I'd still be allowed in, <laughs> but I was, and I was a really good sitter. I loved sitting, and... Um, what, can I ask, what, do you, what makes a good sitter? Do you have any insight into this? Because obviously this is of interest to me because of what I do. Mm. I've also sat for portraits. And I think there is, there's a real art to being a good sitter, but could you say what you've gleaned, maybe? Yeah, I mean, it sounds almost, but I feel like, God, how do you know you're a good sitter? But I think partly because I really enjoyed it. Mm. I knew how to find a good pose that I felt good in. Yeah. I knew how to um, talk and then not talk. and. I just knew how to be there mm. and I felt very involved in the painting as it went along yeah. and I seemed to know how to respond to what was needed of me and I think you know when you're in your teens you don't really know what's right or wrong you just feel so awkward about everything it was like a sort of you know Mitford type of education you knew how to speak French and learn the piano and mm. do these really useful things. And this was a useful thing that I, I found I could do. And do you think, was it useful for, for you as a young woman to, to see yourself becoming a subject and, and through that perhaps gaining a sense of self or confidence? But when you're sitting and then there's a painting of you, it yeah. isn't necessarily you exactly. You yeah. have, I have given everything and then, you know, depending on how flattering it was, like, <laughs> where I wanted, but generally I, I felt sort of connected to the outcome. Yeah. Um, Did you see the painting pr progress? Mm. Because some artists don't want to show you 
until it's finished, but did, were you able to see the progression? Yeah, yeah. always after we, I would always look and it wasn't often that, I mean, he didn't have any kind of mi mysterious kind of behaviors of you can't look at anything. And yeah. so, I mean, I was obviously very careful not to say some stupid thing. <laughs> and, uh, and also I wanted to sort of say things that denoted my enjoyment of mm -hmm. being involved and you know just things like seems to be going really well or <laughs> something <laughs> <laughs> pretty obvious but see you tomorrow same time same place <laughs> I mean yeah. things like that was what really mattered he didn't mm. want me to talk about brush strokes you know <laughs> once I tried and he said I don't want to know about that <laughs> and I said oh, okay <laughs> probably I mean I sort of did but I didn't know how to ask about those things or I felt like I was talking someone else's language when once I said I asked him if I could do an interview with him for a magazine and so I tried to ask him about technique and I didn't know what I meant mm. and he was very quick to say I don't think you know, <laughs> you know that thing and then I asked him about poems and things and that was so interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you, I mean, over, over the years that you, I mean, many years that you sat for your father, from the age of six months, which is extraordinary, it's such a wonderful painting um, in, in the Devonshire collection, did, did the relationship change? Did the, did the dynamic change? Or, or was it always very um, artist model? Um, or father-daughter as well? Or but well, very, I, it was, because I didn't grow up with him, so... Yeah. When I, I moved to London when I was 16 and then I started spending time with him and I was, I was always the person that would, you know, if he'd ring up at midnight and say, do you want to come to the Zanzibar, I'd always go, you know, I'd always be thrilled. <laughs> and um, then I started sitting for him, I think I was 18 and, um, and then the last painting I sat for, my son was three months old mm. and I also... I had a business and, you know, I didn't really have, you know, it wasn't one of those businesses where you can take time off. It was the only time where it didn't feel natural. It was exhausting. Yeah. And then he found a sitter who took up all his time and I just segued out and that was the last picture. But it, that picture was finished? No, it was just the start. I've okay. got the start of but it. But it exists. And the last picture that was finished, I was sitting in a chair, yeah. and that took about two years all in all, because after about a year, I asked if he would do me, draw me an invite for one of my shows, and that, for some reason, <laughs> took a year. <laughs> and so <laughs> I was sitting for a long time, but again, it, it didn't matter, even though the show had like gone past a number <laughs> of times. <laughs> it, I just... It so deadlines only applied to the sitter, <laughs> but not to him. <laughs> yeah, and somehow those things didn't seem, nothing really mattered, mm. except I knew it was very important to be, if I was going to sit, that I was there, present. And so the last painting, even though I felt awfully sad that I wasn't going to be going around and all these rituals and things that we always did and, you know, we'd have a cup of or whatever it was we did when we'd have a break I wouldn't be doing those things because my life had got s so fulfilled that yeah. I didn't have time to give that as much to him how, I mean not to get too sort of psychoanalytical but how do you think your father felt about that did he think of it as, as, as in some ways a rejection or he just moved on to find someone yeah, else yeah he was just painting I remember he met someone and they were very available right. and then he said I'm just going to work on this painting. Okay. And yeah. then it wasn't, we were just carried on the rest of our relationship. Yeah. So it was kind of interesting in that my kind of, that we, you know, I suppose the insecurity of like, I'm not giving something. Yeah. Am I still going to, you know? Yeah get his love, you know, the yeah. endless question of daughter to father, um, or maybe not for some people, but <laughs> <laughs> certainly for me. I, yeah, I can't imagine, because even as a sitter, 
there, I think for everyone there's a bit of, you want it to work for the yeah. artist, and when it doesn't work, you almost feel a degree of failure. And I think mapping that onto also a, a father-daughter relationship, it must be quite complex. But I, I wanted to ask you also if there were paintings that didn't work, and, and the reason I wanted to ask that, just touching on the idea of a, an unfinished work, is um, years ago I worked on an exhibition at the Met in New York about a history of unfinished works from the Renaissance to now, and there was a whole section on unfinished Freud, which is so fascinating, oh, yeah. because in the unfinished works you see a really unusual and very particular technique that lots of artists begin with one area of the composition. In the, in the case of a portrait, often they'll start somewhere on the face. And it seems you're from the unfinished works, what we know is that your father always began in the middle of the face and worked out. Yeah, yeah. It's extraordinary, it's very unusual. Did you, so first of all, were, were, there, were there works that, you said the final work, for example, was never finished? Yes, so there's a sort of sketch and there's a beginning um, and then, but he obviously thought it was good enough to keep because mm. it, it wasn't scrapped, which was his term for, you know, nev not wanting something to be seen. Yeah. Yeah, then there are the beginnings of, the, the painting that I have is an unfinished painting. Yeah. And it, it is finished, it's yeah. just not filled in. And yeah. it's, um, and I know he, he really liked that painting. It, and it must have been quite nerve-wracking to, th to think of giving all these hours for a painting that wasn't perhaps brought to fruition. And it, just to bring it into some of the works on display tonight, there's a fantastic quote um, from the then Duchess of Devonshire, Deborah Duchess of Devonshire, the wonderful portrait of her that he did, um, which was done, I think, around 1959 when, when, when her and the Duke moved back to Chatsworth and, and opened it up after the Second World War and a very difficult period. She said that basically, you know, she would, she would go and sit in the studio for three hours every morning over several months. This is a quote now. He worked very slowly, often starting with one eye. Sometimes when I arrived, he would say, quote, I had a wonderful night. I removed everything I did yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sort of cat and mouse. It seems quite, but was it difficult? Was it nerve wracking to think, well, I, I may have spent all these hours for nothing? To no, no, I mean, it was just, that's how it was. Yeah. That, I mean, there was no, I didn't really have to be in, you know, I just felt, I just thought, oh, well, that's how you paint. Mm. You know, if it's not working, you take it out. I mean, yeah. I suppose much the same as anything else. If I make a thing and a garment and it doesn't work, I'll tear it to bits and start again. So it seems like a good idea. And because I wasn't, didn't have a time limit, I wasn't, commissioning this thing with this tiny amount of, you know. Ah, the word commission, <laughs> we should talk about that. So we, we were just having a sort of informal conversation before and I, 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 I made a faux pas. And I was, I was talking about what's interesting in this display of works, obviously the Freuds, but the other works including the Reynolds, uh, the Michael Craig Martin, is that, um, well the Reynolds and the Michael Craig Martin were commissioned by the family. Obviously the Rembrandt was an acquisition. Um, and I say this as a, as a museum that both acquires, but also uniquely, we also commission. It's a very different thing, commissioning a work than just buying a work. And so I, I mentioned the commission word, and you, you very correctly uh, pulled me up right away and explained what your father thought of that word. Well, I hope I didn't sound so condemning. It was very kind. <laughs> it was very kind, it but was, I got the message. It was <laughs> only that he, when, it, when I heard him, anyone say that, about commissioning, he, he would always say, I, I never take commissions, I don't do that. And, um, and I think, I mean, I'm sort of interpreting this, but he didn't want to be at the behest of somebody. Mm. Um, and he wanted to be the one who was in control. And I think, you know, that even with the Devonshires, that he wanted to be doing his best work for, for them. And, he, and yeah. so I would hear about this family and it would be incredibly interesting and exciting. Yeah. And then I felt terribly touched to find that me as a baby is part of their collection. And it mm. feels like I'm joining your family, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, because my family was so unconventional, it was so sort of um, fragile in, in a way mm. that other people's families seem really exotic mm. and um, 
you know, the sort of traditional setup of them and um, even them kind of claiming each other in that way. Yeah. So uh, I suppose now being, you know, seeing paintings wherever they are of me, and I, I sat, I think I, there's about 10 paintings or possibly 11 of including, you know, one from a photograph of, of me and him. Mm. That feels very like a bond and kind of like a nice feeling that I imagine people who have nice big families have. Yeah. Maybe, you know, that's my fantasy anyway. Family portraits. Yeah. 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 And it, it must also be nice to know that the paintings of you, for example, the, the beautiful one of you as, a, as an infant, six months old, are in a good home. Yeah. And well looked after. I've seen it there. It's very, <laughs> very nice. So it's lovely. And then, I mean, just thinking a bit about this particular family collection, because obviously, you know, as I, as I sort of alluded to in passing, it was very long standing and it began right as the then Duke and Duchess moved back to Chatsworth in 1959. Uh, I believe that Freud was one of the very first house guests, which seemed quite deliberate, perhaps, to have an artist rather than a peer. And I mean that in two senses. Um, and of course, it, it, it was maintained over you know, many decades and two generations. And I think what's interesting, and you've seen this now on the screen behind us, including this fantastic work, which is site-specific. And you can't say that very often about Lucian Freud, but it was painted mm -hmm. in situ uh, for a bathroom at Chatsworth um, on, I believe, be begun on his first visit in 1959. But it just, I mean, it seemed that he was obviously drawn to this place and this family and this context. And I mean, did you talk much about it? Or? Not really, not in that way, but yeah. more in a, a sort of gossipy, but not in that sense gossipy, but about people. Mm. Um, and I would hear these interesting and stories. And also when I got to know my father, he didn't really go out of London. So the idea that he would be in the country even seemed quite yeah. wild, you know, like, God, he, he had a different life then. Yeah. Um, and he would do things differently. The idea of him working outside of his studio, you know, when I would visit him, he'd always be in the studio. You know, he would, I remember him saying to my sister Esther, he thought abroad should be scrapped because he just didn't want to go anywhere. <laughs> he only wanted to be there. Yeah. And um, so it was like a sort of more fantasy idea of him as an artist. And, and then, but it was, you know, sometimes he would just suddenly, like when he, I asked him to write my name when I started my fashion business because he had this funny, cool writing. And, and then he, he was just unusually during a break had a sketch pad. And then he handed me this thing and it was, he'd done this little box with my name and the tiny drawing of the dog in between. <laughs> and, and then I could sort of imagine him being in that bathroom at Chatsworth and just mm. starting to work. And also, I remember when, once when we were sitting on a night picture, he suddenly, in a break, disappeared into the sitting room, which was a bit like one of those bourgeois rooms we never <laughs> went in, <laughs> even though he'd obviously come from that background, but certainly you didn't see much bourgeois behavior. But um, <laughs> he started painting the wall with a paintbrush, you know, not a, you know, just a normal paintbrush, you know, like that. Yeah. And then he painted the whole room brown Gosh. with this, <laughs> <laughs> and it was fantastic yeah, yeah. and it was such fun and so we'd go in there sometimes and he would just paint away and it really made you want to join in and the record player was in there and so sometimes we'd put a fat swallow record on and dance but he had this very fancy carpet and he said don't don't go on the carpet, let's go around the outside. <laughs> <laughs> House so proud. <laughs> we'd just sort of do the, and he'd do these kind of crazy dancing, yeah. and we'd just dance around the edge of the room. Yeah. And it was so nice. <laughs> was this the studio in Nottingham? In Holland Park, yes. yeah. That was before he, he moved to um, Kensington yes. um, okay. Church Street, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it was at the top of four flights of stairs, which he used to run up. 
yeah. every time, which I still do. I caught the habit. I run up the stairs all the time. And I always think of him, you know, and yeah. uh, he'd run up the stairs and then he had double doors in case someone tried to get in. He'd have a metal stick behind the door. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't paranoid. He was just, you know, like a wild person in yeah. that way. He didn't want anyone to, people laughing, who, anyone who knew him, he just was tense all the time in this, you know, ninja type of way. And uh, yeah. if he had, you he had a f I, I didn't really know him, but I, I sort of saw him a bit. Mm. And he had a fox-like quality, I thought, very agile and very alert. Mm, he was very strong as well. So yeah. if you were crossing the road, which was never at a zebra crossing, he'd grab you by the arm and just propel you over the road. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, everything was kind of quite exciting. And I mean, just to round out, I, also I want to um, have questions from the audience because I'm sure many people will have questions. It's such a gift to have this insight and thank you so much for being so generous with it. I mean, just thinking about the span of the collection at Chatsworth, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, it's quite extraordinary because it goes from very early works to late works. It encompasses um, works that were bought, that were probably given, that were not commissioned, but done in dialogue, uh, you could say. But I suppose there's some particular interests in which relate to the setting of the house and relate to the countryside and indeed sort of aristocratic life, whether it's horses, which were you know, obviously a great interest of your father mm. in multiple ways. And one of the very earliest works is of a horse and the very extraordinary late work that you'll see on the screen of this, this crop of the, the back of a mare's hindquarters, which is really remarkable, is one of the latest works. I mean, do you think th this particular context was of interest for him? Dogs, of course, are also important. And was he sort of thinking about a different, a different context than perhaps the city life? Yeah, I think he was always interested in in aristocratic family life. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, I suppose because the people, not sort of generally, but it was, I suppose, certain people who lived those lives. Yeah. And so he liked, he liked the Devonshires and... But I mean, just to be clear, I think what's extraordinary about the work is that he treats everyone the same. Mm. In a portrait, this you, you can barely distinguish someone's social status or background or context, whether it's the Queen, and of course that was always, yeah. I mean, apart from the Crown. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it, you would actually, and even in these portraits, if you think about it, you would struggle to, to assign, if you didn't know the sitter, you would struggle to assign a particular social class or background to them. He seems just very interested in the face, the physiognomy, the character, not, not someone's social position. That seems irrelevant. I think he liked the person and then everything yeah. about them was of interest. Their social position, yeah. you know, how they lived their life. And that was, you know, he wasn't snobbish in that way. You know, he was very discriminating in the best sense. I learned that word from him to mean a good thing, not yeah. a bad thing. In, in choosing people that he found interesting and stimulating. Yeah, he, he, he wasn't... I mean, <laughs> I remember he very kindly came to my son's uh, primary school. Mm. I think they were about six or seven. And then the teacher, you know, in a very nice way said, oh, these are all little artists. And he said, no. <laughs> 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 he wasn't having it, you know. <laughs> Ouch. It was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, harsh. Um, I think this might be a nice, I'm speechless, so this might be a nice moment to see if there are any um, questions. Otherwise, I, I've got other things I want to ask you, but I also want to give other people the, the chance. Um, if you want to just put your hand up in, yes, and there's a roving mic. Oh my God, this is like an auction. I have a bit at the back. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a really fascinating conversation. Um, I think I've heard that uh, your father was had an incredibly penetrating gaze when he was focused on a sitter. Uh, was that your experience, and, and what was it like being under his gaze? Yeah, he had this thing. He would look very intensely and then open his eyes a bit more, as if to get more into the picture. And uh, so... I'd watch him do that and then I 
I went through a phase of copying him. Uh, <laughs> it, was <laughs> it was rather silly, me doing it. But um, I <laughs> thought maybe I would, you know, be able to get more by. But he did do that. So when I was sitting for him, it would be, it would be like a zoom lens, I suppose, to use a really banal analogy. But you just got used to him him scrutinizing, looking for what he wanted. And um, nothing was intimidating because it, it felt good. It felt good being there, really. So, But it was, yeah, he had this kind of, you know, I can only pause for a second and scan around and look and absorb. And yeah. he had these very pale blue eyes. And um, yeah, it was part of the thing. I, I want to, if I can, just ask a follow-on question, which you, you sort of alluded to before, but um, in terms of being scrutinized, uh, you said very eloquently that, you know, you had to hand over your image in a way to, to the painting, but was it difficult to kind of give yourself over? And also, you know, as, as a young woman, was it difficult to see an image of yourself that maybe didn't feel, didn't register, didn't feel flattering, or you always were able to disassociate and say, this is a painting, this is my father's work? I, I, I did like all my paintings. Yeah. I did two nudes. One I like much more than the other because I look better. But I mean, <laughs> I'm just normal. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah. I don't. But I, even the one that I like less, I, I suppose I feel it's more, I feel there's a painting. And the other one I think, oh my God, there's me. You know, don't, yeah. that's yeah. a painting. You know, I just like it even more. But you know, yeah. I don't feel at all embarrassed about being vain about <laughs> <laughs> that. But yeah. there's one, you know, some of the paintings, there's one in particular, a really small picture of, of my head, and I, I look a bit like a boy. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I yeah. love that painting yeah. so much. It looks a bit like my son. and. I, um, There's so much vulnerability. Yeah, to that I feel it was a s weird moment in my life, and I just felt like he was taking care of me somehow by mm. painting me. And yeah. then sometimes I remember him doing a an etching of himself, a self portrait, where he looked like he was really suffering. And and I said, I I really need to have that. I wanted to take care of him by having this yeah. this etching, so I could just. I, because I, it was he was a difficult person to comfort, and um, partly because he was so restless. Mm. But I remember when Lee Bowery died, and I, and he was really upset, and I just found myself. I just sat at his feet on the chair. I didn't really know what else to do, mm. but I just wanted this proximity, because I didn't have much of that either. You know, we weren't like a. Again, I hadn't grown up, you know, in this kind of cuddly way. Or, um, but it was nice to find do things that seem rather odd, but to do them and instead of not doing things. Yeah. And um, yeah. And the, you know, there is tenderness there because I suppose one of the cliches of your father's work, of what people say, is that they can be very. Not harsh, but you know they, they're, they're unflinching certainly. But I think within that, there's there is tenderness, especially mm. that, that, as you said, that beautiful portrait of you. Um, I would very much include that in that category. Are there other questions? I want to allow time for. Yes, we've got two here. So, is there a side of you that hates him? <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> Gosh, um, I wouldn't say that, but. Um, when he was quite old and I knew he was going to die, I thought, I wonder if when he dies, I'll be freer to be myself. Mm. And it was exactly what happened. And it was as though he gave me a parting gift of not passing, because he had such strong opinions and they were so brilliant, his opinions, that it was very difficult not to want to have his opinion on anything, even though I knew it should have been my opinion, you know, 
whatever it was I was doing, but it made maybe me defer my, to my own self-belief. So I never, I never hated him. Um, I loved him sort of in a crazy way, but it was so, it was liberating when he died, and um, it, it was a sort of loving liberation. Hmm. As a father myself, I have to say you're incredibly brave to be sitting there doing this, because he wouldn't have done it. I'm sure I wouldn't have done it when he was alive, but then <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he, in a way, he was, you know, he, want, he was very, very private, and all of us, his family and his loyal friends mm. were dedicated to his privacy. But I don't think he didn't want people to know about him. So I feel that I don't feel like I'm betraying any trust at all. I, I feel like I hope I'm keeping him, yeah. him alive and telling these things that somehow maybe I wouldn't have even thought of at the time. I was so involved in the feeling of being in his company that I often can't remember that many sort of you know, stories or whatever. My sister Esther, who's a brilliant storyteller and that's her job, she's a writer, she remembers more incidents, but I just remember feelings of, um, you know. Thank you. I would just say that, you know, I think often in life, great artists want to protect their privacy, to protect their time, to give it to their work. And so it can seem as if they're, they're, some, they're hiding something or withdrawing. And then often they will deliberately leave people in charge of their legacy that will um, make sure that it is discussed and reassessed. And so I think it's a two-stage process. I think in life, great artists really just want to focus on their work and make their work so they can seem somehow defensive. And then, I, yeah, I, I think those two things are not incommensurate at all. So, Also, yeah. it's quite good the way he didn't really leave any of his children in charge of his legacy so we could get on with our own lives. Yeah. And there is a sort of longing to be involved in his legacy because it's comforting and cosy. But yeah. it's very time consuming and I am very pleased that in a way by example of not being involved in his family's legacy and you know being so kind of determined to be a painter yeah. and not a type of painter or nationality or anything, just a painter. Mm. I think that was a really good example that has been very useful. To not burden you too much, yeah. Yeah. There was another question here, I think. I just, if you could wait for the microphone, thank you. Thank you. The painting uh, takes a great deal of time and you are the sitter. I, you know. So how much time is, is it all the time you are sitting there or there are certain parts which she builds into a sculptural quality built up and uh, so in other words when you're not there he paint a certain part of the painting while you're not there sitting and you just keep on building sometimes not very much considering how much he could have done that but he liked to have someone there even when he was painting yeah. the corner of the room but depending on the painting i think sometimes david would his assistant would, if it was a big picture, he would be the form mm -hmm. while he painted some of the background or... But I'm just trying to think of my paintings, like maybe when the painting of the Watto where I was one of, mm. there were about four of us and then there was a child on the floor, but. There was always someone there, but he didn't have... I think we were only all there right at the start when he was sketching, and then it was mostly me and Celia. Mm. And, uh, but, yeah, he, mm. he seemed to like to have the centre there, mm -hmm. even if... Yeah, it's a kind of a uh, symbiotic... Kind of you might get lonely without the sitter, you know? It's a yeah. kind of a, mm. a perpetual on continuation, and it's part of the play there's someone, the warmth and all that, right? The presence of another I think it makes some sort of dimensional mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't really know, because mm -hmm. I'm not remotely technical. You're a painter, so... Mm -hmm. 
but uh, yeah, so he liked to he liked to have someone there if they could be. So um, yeah. Thank you. Did did you see his process change over the years you sat for him? Because I mean, obviously, this collection also spans pretty much his entire career. Mm. Your sittings go from being six months of age, uh, and did you did it make a difference? Because obviously, the, his evolving technique and style is a very important part of the work. Or um, I think when I started sitting, you know, as a teenager, he painted a lot in that way. Mm. Um, it was a bit freer than these paintings, perhaps, and. Yeah. And then, you know, the later ones, they seem to have more paint on the canvas. Yeah. I don't know why, but there it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it just felt like he was pushing ahead, always trying to yeah. go somewhere a bit further forward. And yeah. yeah. I, I think our time might be up. I actually just want to ask one final quick question, if I can, which is you, you, you just mentioned the beautiful painting um, based around Watto, which I believe was in the National Gallery, mm -hmm. uh, fantastic exhibition last year for the centenary. Is it strange to see those paintings you sat for in those very private, intimate moments becoming so historic and historicized, or it's part of the process? Seems great. Seems <laughs> like great. Good. You did it. You know, you yeah. won. It was. Yeah, wonderful. I know he liked the idea of people being able to see them. Mm. So to have it in, in the National Gallery and seemed fantastic. Yeah.